Welcome to a fresh new podcast. Today is Friday, April 12, 2024. I'm Crash, and Mary Danielson is back at the host mic. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everyone here and all the listeners. And we are welcoming back J.B. Hickson today, and we have a great topic this morning. We're going to discuss the anatomy of deception. And I have to admit here that uh, now that the eclipse is over, it kind of triggered me a little bit with all those pseudo prophecies that went on. And I think, you know, it's deception is ramped up in these times, so we're going to discuss that this morning. But first, we're going to have our scripture and pray, and then we'll get right to it. This morning, I have Proverbs 22, 17 to 21. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it is a pleasant thing if you keep them within you. Let them all be fixed upon your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I've instructed you today, even you, Have I not written to you excellent things of counsels and knowledge, that I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth, that you may answer words of truth to those who send to you? Pray with me this morning, would you please? Lord, we thank you for that wisdom and understanding that you give uh, liberally if we but ask, and we long to draw nearer to you day by day. And so we ask, Lord, also that you um, cause us to be ever mindful of your presence, and to seek the things above, even moment by moment. And we ask for help with their ever-present distractions, Lord. There are so many that could hinder us from true fellowship with you. We thank you for J.B. and his ministry and his faithfulness, and and we lift him up to you and his loved ones, and we ask for good health and an ever-deepening relationship with you and with one another uh, for their fellowship, to knit their hearts together as a family also. In Jesus' name, amen. J.B. is back with us, author, podcaster, and pastor, and well-versed in all things related to prophecy and the challenges that we all face to our faith in these times. He's pastor at Plum Creek Chapel in Sedalia, Colorado, and president of Not By Works Ministries, notbyworks.org. Also books, Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1 and 2, Spirit of the False Prophet. Um, These are great resources, and I highly recommend those. Welcome back to Stand Up for the Truth, J.B. Hey, great to be with you, Mary. Thanks so much for having me back on. Looking forward to it. Uh, tell us about the new website design and the new app. Uh, it's really nice what I can see here. Tell us about how that came about. Yeah, we are really excited about it. It's just been a, a busy uh, week here, but for the last six or eight months, we've been working on a new website and a new app, and uh, we rolled out both of these, the app first about a week ago, and then the website just a couple of days ago, and just really grateful for uh, Brooke, uh, who is our operations manager. Uh, she also happens to be my daughter, one of my daughters, but uh, uh, she's been with us a year and a half, and this was a part of her Uh, her uh, initiative, and we are so pleased with it. It just, uh, everything's integrated. You know, you can get to all of our content uh, from the app. So we encourage folks to go to uh, the Apple Store or Google Play Store, whichever you use, and just search NBW Ministries, and you can find the free app, and it will have all of our uh, videos, podcasts, devotionals, uh, resources, events, live stream, all of those things. And the web is perfectly integrated with it as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, thanks for... uh, uh, for mentioning that. We're excited about it. And I love how when ministries more and more now are getting towards apps, and it's such a, a an excellent way to just uh, get what you need right up front, uh, the resources that are available, and they are many with Not By Works. So good job, everyone, on all of that. Um, I want to talk about deception this morning because, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the in the intro here, that eclipse speculation was rampant. Uh, on what the significance might be. People just added silly prophecies upon faulty pseudoscience with a side of spirituality, and it kind of made me wonder, is that because people um, are so hungry to assign meaning to things that really aren't that uncommon? Is it ignorance primarily? JB, is it symptomatic of something else, I think is what I'm really asking. We're seeing this, but is it a symptom of something else? It really, I think it is, because the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy 3.13 that evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. And so the closer we get to the return of the Lord and the end of the age, the more mm-hmm. deception will, in fact, be rampant. And, of course, the enemy knows that. That's his whole M.O., which we're going to be talking about today. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think he's ratcheting up the misinformation, the disinformation, the malinformation. <laughs> uh, we had a guest on uh, 
earlier this week, or maybe it was last week, but anyway, no, it was this week because it was on the day of the uh, it was on the day of the okay. eclipse, and he was talking about how people have speculated that the last three eclipses that were visible here in the U.S., you know, it if you look at the path that they took, the path of totality, that it made a the Greek letter or an, a Hebrew letter, right. and you know, mm-hmm. just all kinds of craziness, <laughs> and it just, uh, you know, I don't know which troubles me more that such wild speculation would exist or that many believers, uh, well-intentioned though they may be, jump on board those bandwagons. Mm-hmm. And, and it really uh, it goes to the some of the issues in my latest book about testing the spirits, yeah. uh, 1 John 4, 1, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, and I wonder sometimes if they're not taking seriously um, that injunction to test the spirits, but also to not bear false witness. I don't think Christians really understand. I mean, that is one of the Ten Commandments, um, but I don't I don't know if they, I think they treat God's Word lightly that they don't take this sort of thing seriously before they jump in. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I would, I, I don't know if I would be, you know, uh, harsh in, in terms of saying, oh, well, they're spreading false information, because I don't think they know. Okay. I think they're, they're deceived and they mean well, uh, and indeed, I mean, there is a lot going on in this world today. And, and in a sense, it's good that we are sort of at least our senses are raised mm-hmm. to the fact that, you know, there could be some signs of the times. We ought to be right. looking at that. But I think we've gone too mm-hmm. far mm-hmm. and we're trying to find a, a sign behind every bush now. And uh, the problem with that is it, it leads us astray. And when you understand the Luciferian conspiracy, you realize that a lot of it is not just organic, natural confusion. It's intentional misleading. It's trying to get people off, mm. uh, you know, away from the Word of God and onto these tangent uh, things that really are not part of uh, God's plan. And a lot of people did jump on it and were encouraged to jump on it. So it, it's like um, a community experience. And my husband mentioned something about it. It's, it strikes him as being uh, perfect for the last days because you can so easily through social media or or seeing David Muir look to the heavens during this eclipse ad, it's so easy to get people to just jump on and have a communal experience because they're looking for community, but I think they're looking for it in all the wrong places. And this is definitely one of those wrong places, I think. And yeah. do you think that, that just that's the spirit of the age involved here? Yeah, no, it's the spirit of the Antichrist, mm-hmm. uh, which John tells us is already at work in the mm-hmm. world and that many Antichrists have come, First John uh, 218. But, you know, there is a silver lining here, and, and that is that, you know, even though people are taking natural events, because let's face it, the eclipse is a natural event. It yeah. happens every so often. It's, this yeah. wasn't some kind of a supernatural sign. Same thing with, you know, blood moons and mm-hmm. some of these other things that through the years have created quite a stir in the Bible prophecy world. The silver lining is it means that people are waking up to Bible prophecy and that they care about Bible prophecy. So for that, I'm grateful. Mm-hmm. It's just we need to always remember our true north, which is the Word of God correctly handled, uh, kind of showing us how things are uh, falling into place. So I get more excited about, you know, some of the geopolitical things, you know, the the stage setting for yeah. Gog Magog and some yeah. of those other clear biblical end times events than I do some of this uh, mystical uh, speculation. <laughs> yeah, I agreed with that. Um, you have some verses in your book. You have a chapter in uh, Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1, and also um, one of the other books that you have here, The Great Last Day's Deception, covers this subject quite a bit. But one of the verses um, that to me kind of says it all, First John 5, 9, the whole world lies under the, sl- the sway of the wicked one. Mary's paraphrase, the whole world operates on lies. <laughs> I think that that's yeah. absolutely Yeah, First John 5, 19, actually. Is it, yeah. is it 5, 19? Oh, and I said, I said yeah. 9, didn't I? 5, 19. And then also Second Timothy three thirteen, evil men and imposters, here's the bad news, will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there's that... Uh, that dual dual edge here of uh, deceiving and being deceived. So the father of lies is the God of this world. We all know that it's going to get worse and worse, which is really kind of hard to imagine, JB. Um, I, I, I worry about people because, especially because of COVID, with, which was rife with lies through and through and people did not see through it. I think that's a good warning to the church on how this verse could absolutely play out, um, getting worse and worse. Uh, false flags, black swan events, all that sort of thing. I don't think the world and maybe even the church is even ready for it to get worse and worse because we're kind of sleepy. Uh, what do you think about we that? We are. Yeah, we, we failed miserably the first attempt there back in 2020. Not not everybody. Yeah. Uh, and frankly, you know, very soon after 
uh, we found ourselves in the throes of the lockdown and the, and the medical tyranny. Uh, many people started waking up, but initially it was a it was a failure for, for sure. Yeah, I definitely think there's a, a black swan uh, coming. In fact, I talked about this in Orlando at a conference. I said, I think mm. it's going to be a black swan carrying a false flag. So I think we're <laughs> going to get double whammied here. But yeah, going back to the Great Last Days Deception, that's a, a book I wrote back in 2012. And it was really my first attempt to kind of make sense of the grand conspiracy you know, the shadow government, the deep state, the unseen hand. There's different names for Satan's attempt to uh, work with his human accomplices to try to uh, take, you know, take over the world, throw off the uh, control of the of, of God Almighty. And uh, so when I knew we were going to be talking about this, I had Brooke uh, set up a, uh, a coupon code. Uh, so if you just use the code stand up, all lowercase, one word, stand up, uh, we're going to offer 25% off that book. It's an older book, so but it, it really explains what we're talking about here in terms of an, the anatomy of deception. And uh, I think it's a good little easy read to kind of explain the Luciferian conspiracy. So The Great Last Days Deception is the name of the book. You can get it from notbyworks.org. And uh, if you use Stand Up, uh, all lowercase, uh, you know, we'll give you a discount on that. And this, the book is still very timely, very pertinent, even if just for laying the groundwork of, of how deception works and what God says about deception, there's plenty of, of great information in there. So I highly recommend that book. Um, and another verse I want to talk about, uh, God hates deception. Proverbs 6, a false witness who pours out lies is one of the things listed as something God detests. And the Bible has a, quite a few verses on, on deception and lying, and uh, it, it's good to take those to heart. It's good to do a, a word study or a, a Bible study on that sort of thing. I think that's uh, very valuable. I want to talk about, uh, JB, because the Bible also talks about delusion. The difference between deception and delusion, they are not the same thing. Uh, I read um, a particular definition that said to deceive is to mislead someone about that which is true, but to delude is to cause them to believe the deception. What do you think about that biblically? Yeah, I think they're related concepts. Uh, delusion is more severe. Okay. And, you know, as you said, and we've quoted it twice now, Second Timothy 3.13, deception is going to get worse and worse. In fact, that's really the running theme with, for, in, in Scripture starting with Satan's attempted coup in heaven when he deceived one-third of the angels to, to come with him, and ever since he met Adam and Eve in the garden. Uh, his deception is the goal. He wants to deceive the world, and it's all coming to a climax in that final seven-year period that we call the tribulation or uh, the day of the Lord's wrath, sometimes it's referred to, or the 70th week of Daniel, the overflowing scourge, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. There are a lot of names for that seven-year period, but that's when it's all going to come ahead. And that's why, by the way, Mary, Jesus in the Olivet Discourse, when he is answering the question of, of what will be the sign of the end of the age and your coming, uh, which he's talking here about the tribulation period, that, that generation right before the second coming of Christ, that's why he emphasizes deception so much. He begins by mm. saying, take heed that no one deceive you. And three or four times in that sermon, he cautions against deception because it is going to be so strong, uh, so strong that even uh, believing Israel, he calls them the elect, but if it were possible, he said, even believing Israel would be deceived and take the mark of the beast. Now, that's not possible, as we know, but he's saying that's just how bad deception is going to be, that if it were possible, even the remnant would, would uh, be mm -hmm. deceived. Mm, those are scary verses. This is Stand Up For The Truth. We are speaking with J.B. Hickson today, uh, notbyworks.org, and we're talking about deception and the ratcheting up of falsehood in these last days. And uh, John eight forty four, there is no truth in him, speaking of the father of lies, the enemy of our souls, and he is the God of this world. So we can just think this through, even on a very cursory level, and we understand that the world is packed with lies, morning, noon, and night. And powerful delusion, J.B., comes in stages, actually, because Second uh, Corinthians uh, chapter 4 says the God of this age is blinding people to the truth. So there's that level of deception. But then when we get to Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians 2, the coming of the lawless one is, is according to the working of Satan with all, all power, signs, lying wonders, and unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth 
that they might be saved. And so for this reason, for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. So it um, that definition, I don't know where that definition came from, but caused them to believe, it says right here, God will send them uh, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth and had pleasure in unrighteousness. So, J.B., let's talk about this. The God of this age is blinding people to the truth, but they also don't love the truth. That's a very interesting tightrope. Yeah, I mean, that's really one of our... Uh, core verses here at NBW Ministries, which we started back in 1999, uh, the the clarity, accuracy, and urgency of the gospel, because Mm -hmm. the devil's primary goal is to keep the lost lost. I mean, that's his goal. He wants to blind their minds from hearing the gospel, because it's the gospel that's the power of God to salvation, Romans 1.16. So, you know, one of the big problems in uh, the, the church today is we have so many false Gospels. In fact, we just released a third edition of my book, uh, Getting the Gospel Wrong, and added a chapter on another, yet another false gospel that has arisen uh, inside the church even. And so there's no shortage of false gospels. But if people believe a false gospel, they're not going to be saved. Uh, they have to believe the pure gospel, which is that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, and all who place their faith in him and him alone to save them personally from their sin will have eternal life. It's pretty simple. So simple a child can understand it. But uh, Paul's first letter that he wrote, uh, you know, under the inspiration of the Spirit, the letter of Galatians, (laughs) he starts right in by saying, look, the gospel matters. And if anybody is preaching a gospel to you other than what we preach to you, because remember, he had visited the region of Southern Galatia on his first missionary journey. He said, let them come under strict judgment. Uh, This is a serious matter to propagate, you know, a false gospel. So it absolutely begins, the deception begins with trying to deceive unbelievers into thinking they can overcome their sin problem by some other mechanism. And and that goes back to the original lie. Satan told uh, you know, Adam and Eve, you will not surely die. In other mm-hmm. words, sin has no consequence. You can sin and get away with it, and uh, don't worry about it. Well, that's a lie. Sin comes with a serious consequence. It separates us from a holy God, and apart from being reborn by faith alone in Christ alone, we're going to die in our sins, Jesus said in John 5, 24, or 8, 24, rather. And so if you don't believe in him, you'll die in your sins. And that means an eternity separated from a holy God in a literal place of torment called hell. So mm. it, you're right. It starts with deceiving the unbeliever, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. But then sadly, believers, even though our home in heaven is secure and we're uh, adopted into the family of God, we are positionally righteous before a holy God and nothing can ever change that. Nevertheless, we can still be, uh, you know, sucked into this deceptive mm-hmm. uh, realm and, and fall prey to Satan's deceptive tactics. Mm-hmm. And we have to bring free will into this because um, she allowed her thoughts to be corrupted. She allowed her emotions to be swayed. And, and people love the darkness because their deeds are evil. So we have to talk about the free will aspect of this. While Satan is blinding them, they did not receive. So God puts um, the onus on humans to not to accept or reject, and I think I think we can't um, overstate the aspect of free will from the garden and entirely through the scriptures. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. I'm so glad you said that because you know there are some folks out there, Calvinists in particular, who suggest we have no choice that you can't believe the gospel unless God saves you first, mm-hmm. and if you're not elect, then you couldn't believe the gospel no matter how much you wanted to. That God mm-hmm. forces you to believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't believe that the Spirit simply draws us to Christ. He drags us to Christ. That's their view. We have no choice, kicking yeah. and screaming. So yeah. I completely disagree. I think it goes all the way back to the garden and the image of God and man. That part of that, uh, you know, divine image is volition, free will. Mm-hmm. And, and and God did not force us to go over and eat the apple, although some Calvinists try to even go that far and yeah. say, yeah, yeah, he did. God made us sin. That's what they say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we, we don't believe that at all. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. We believe we have a free will. And God warned us against uh, eating of that fruit, but we chose of our own volition to eat of it and brought on ourselves the consequences. Mm-hmm. Similarly, we have to, of our own free will, choose to accept the free gift. It's a universal offer, bona fide mm-hmm. offer, come one, come all, whosoever will, let him come drink of the water of life freely, the Bible says, Revelation. Mm-hmm. But, but you know, he we have to make that decision. And uh, so, you know, to, to suggest somehow that, you know, God 
you know, that there's not this uh, sort of um, sense in which we made the choice uh, kind of misses the whole point. That, that would mean that God made a bunch of robots or automatons, right, but right. what's the glory in that, right? Right. And if there was no God, there would be no free will. See, that's that's the thing right. I think they don't understand, because then there would be no courts of justice if there was no God. And it wouldn't matter what anyone did to you or any anything that they did uh, day to day in their lives if there was no free will. And I think uh, I think the Calvinists completely have not thought that through uh, and yet, no. that that is a huge belief system today. So I, I think that um, that's a big part of this. And also, strong delusion is part of God's judgment, giving over, giving people over to their sin and what they've chosen. Um, and strong delusion that they would believe the lie is is uh, is judgment. Yeah, that's Second Thess two two eleven. I think it is, and it really follows the same pattern theologically and teaching that Paul gave us in Romans one. You know, mm-hmm. remember Romans one eighteen to thirty two. You know, first. Uh, they set themselves against the truth. And then second, God gave them over to their desires so that they became slaves to their passion. Uh, and then, of course, third, we face the eternal consequence for that. So, uh, you know, you have to rebel against God and, and stiffen your heart and harden your heart. You know, it's like Pharaoh. People always talk about how, well, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? You go back and look at the text, you know, Pharaoh hardened his own heart seven mm-hmm. times before God hardened it. So, mm-hmm. you know, this is uh, this is the proper step here. So when it says God talking about in the future tribulation period after the Antichrist takes the helm in Second Thessalonians 2, you know, God will give them over over to strong delusion. It's, look, if you want to believe a lie bad enough, you know, God's not going to, you know, stand in the way, you know. He's not going to force you to believe the truth. Yes. Uh, There's a quote here I read this morning by Frederick Nietzsche, the the existentialist guy, and he says, this is is interesting insight. He said, with all great deceivers, there's a noteworthy occurrence to which they owe their power. In the actual act of deception, they are overcome by belief in themselves it is this which then speaks so miraculously and compellingly to those around them. In other words, it starts with self-delusion. How can it not? That has to be the beginning of deception. And you can look at Joseph Smith and all these other people, um, and it started with self-deception. That's a very slippery slope, isn't it, JB? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that's where we're at. The worst kind of deception mm. is, is self-deception. And when you get there, it's, you know, you don't even realize, you know, that you're deceived. And so I think that's what's happening with a lot of people today, especially since, you know, the the, uh, the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't, they, they just, their pride won't let them admit that they, they bought into yeah. a farce. Yeah. And so they are going to dig their heels in and stick to their guns. And I, I still see people out there that are, you know, we live in Colorado, so we live out in the in the mountains, and uh, we see people jogging on uh, trails and forest trails mm-hmm. and things out, nobody around within a mile of them, and, and you see, you pass them, <laughs> and they're wearing masks, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. because they have bought into the lie, even though science for hundreds of years, you can go back, I quoted these early 20th century journal articles, peer-reviewed, saying unequivocally that masks do nothing against acute respiratory viruses, yet here we go. Uh, when when mm-hmm. Fauci and uh, others, uh, you know, Jerome Powell and other, not Jerome Powell, but uh, the Surgeon General, uh, all stand up and say, oh, the science has switched. We've suddenly discovered that these will, and in fact, stop these viruses. People believed it, mm-hmm. and it's hard to, you know, Mark Twain famously said, it's easier to deceive people than to convince them they've been deceived. Wow. So that's really where a lot of people are at. Yeah, and you know, JB, if I had to make a list of the biggest deceivers of this century, Fauci, I do believe would be my top top dog for this yeah. re- award, um, yeah. you know, and they brought out the professional liars. In other words, a veneer of, well, we're the professionals. This We speak for science. And so they add that veneer of, of we know better than you and we're smarter than you. And so you have to buy these lies. The things that they will do to convince people that what they're doing is true because they are self-deceived. It's the Fauci Award. I think I'm going to start a new, uh, a new thing, give the Fauci Award <laughs> for the deceivers of the century. Yeah, I remember Forbes magazine had an article in the height of the pandemic that I cited uh, in my books that said, whatever you do, don't do your own research. Just sit back and trust us. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not smart enough to figure it out. Don't do your own research. Just believe us. And that's Satan's weapon. Well, and don't read the Bible for yourself because you won't understand it. That that was what my denomination told me as a young person growing up until the Lord um, took that veil away from my eyes. But um, lies, lies, everywhere lies. 
Uh, and I want to mention one more communal lie, JB, that is in Revelation 3.13. I want to go on to uh, talk about the church not being immune to deception, but I first want to read this one. Um, uh, Revelation 13, uh, 3 and 4, And I saw one of his heads as if, as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? In other words, he is invincible, is what people think. This is a fascinating little, little uh, not little, prophecy in here that I think a lot of people don't think about. But when you tie it with Thessalonians, all power in lying signs and wonders. This, this to me, is a big one. W- what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's really, like I said, the culmination of the cosmic battle that began in the heavenlies, uh, redirected to earth, and has been raging for 6,000 years. It yeah. will culminate in the unholy trinity with Satan, uh, who wants to be God and wants to be worshipped. Uh, you know, working with the Antichrist, who corresponds to the second person of the Trinity, the true Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, and then the false prophet, who corresponds to uh, the Holy Spirit. And just as the Holy Spirit today is drawing people to Christ and uh, convicting them Mm -hmm. of sin, righteousness, and judgment, the false prophet will preside over the beast system and and draw people, in fact, in his case, force them, uh, under penalty of death, to worship uh, the Antichrist, and uh, it really is uh, amazing when you read how many people will will fall prey to those uh, yeah. those glittering, shiny lights. But uh, not all that glitters is gold. It's so interesting that that the Bible sees fit to quote the people talking. Who is like him, and who is able to make war with him? I think that's very interesting uh, in its detail. And I want to go back to uh, something we had started uh, about the church not being immune to deception, and how this must have grieved Paul when he said, After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples at, draw away disciples after themselves, Acts 20, 29, and 30. What was Paul's, uh, his heart, of course, was that this would not happen, and the same with all of us. We, we don't want to see that savage wolves, but... Um, men among yourselves? How does that happen, J.B.? Yeah, and that's in the context of, you know, remember he he's in Miletus and he calls the Ephesian elders to come visit him. He had spent a great deal of time in Ephesus, had a real heart for that church, dealt with all kinds of spiritual warfare there, and that's why the book of Ephesians has so much to say about spiritual warfare. But yeah, he calls these, uh, these early church leaders together and he says, look, uh, watch out because there are going to be these uh, wolves who come in among you. It's the same thing Jesus mentioned to the early Jewish uh, culture in in his very first sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, It's no different. Uh, Throughout time, Satan has always infiltrated God's people and tried to lead them astray. Mm -hmm. He wants to keep the lost lost and the saved defeated. That's his two goals. And so he's blinding men's hearts and minds to the gospel to keep Mm -hmm. them lost, but once we're saved, he's not done with us yet. He's going to continue to attack, discourage, defeat, get us uh, you know, away from the uh, spirit, walking in the flesh, uh, shipwrecked in the faith, sidelined mm. in the mm. battle. That's, that's his goal. So yeah, mm. Paul issues a strong warning there about that. I, that that's one phrase that really uh, breaks my heart, shipwrecked in the faith. It, it just seems like that shouldn't happen. And yet we talked about free will. Uh, that's definitely a part of that as well. I want to talk also about, I think when we come back, I want to talk more about um, believers having the wrong Jesus. People say, what do you mean the wrong Jesus? How how can you have the wrong Jesus? Um, The wrong gospel. Um, If someone comes and preaches a different gospel, um, let them be accursed. And and there there are a lot of warnings about, and Paul warned people day and night with tears. And I want to talk to you when we come back about naming names and things like that so people know who the deceivers are. So we are with J.B. Hickson. Uh, He's back with us today. Always a pleasure. Notbyworks.org. And uh, we're going to talk about all this and more when we come back. We're going to take a break here for two minutes. And then we have so much more to talk about regarding deception and some of the biggest lies ever told. So stay with me um, for the second half of Stand Up For The Truth. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. 
Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for April the 12th. We're speaking with J.B. Hickson, notbyworks.org. And we've mentioned uh, your books in the past, J.B., Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1 and 2, Spirit of the False Prophet, and also The Great Last Day's Deception, a great primer on deception, what it is, and how and exposing uh, Satan's deception and the New World Order. Um, you have a way that people can order this through your website? Yeah, so if you go to our website, notbyworks.org, and click on the store button, if you're interested in The Great Last Day's Deception, you can click on it. It'll tell you a little bit more about the book. Uh, But we've set up a limited time uh, 25% off discount. Uh, Just use the coupon code STANDUP, all one word, all lowercase, STANDUP. And, uh, and it'll get you 25% off. But yeah, that book was my first attempt to try to expose after we woke up, Wendy and I, to the reality of k- kind of the Satan's evil agenda and how much we had been deceived, and, and like so many Christians. And I just felt, felt an urgency to get the message out there. So we put that together. And then, of course, over the years, as we've continued our deep dive and gone down the rabbit hole, we've We've expanded the research, you know, extensively, and that gave rise to my last three books. But this is a good little introduction to the Luciferian conspiracy. It's called The Great Last Day's Deception, and uh, folks can check it out at notbyworks.org. Yes, yeah, sounds good. And I know sometimes a prophecy book is written sometime back, and, and they sometimes they just become obsolete before they even get printed, but this one not, and none of your books are because there's so much reference material in there so people can get a basic understanding of many different topics that apply to the last days. And JB, now that we're back here um, uh, in the second half, I want to talk about the church because um, the wrong Jesus, you know, the Mormon Jesus, the New Age Jesus, you say that to people, you have the wrong Jesus, and they look at you like, what are you talking about? They don't, it never occurs to them um, that the the Jesus as revealed, his nature as revealed throughout the scriptures, is that that is something that you don't get to play with. You don't get to change uh, how he his nature and how he has expressed himself to the world and to the unbelievers. But how? My, I guess my question for you is: How does our fallen nature play a part in false doctrine spreading? Because people seem to they don't seem to have any conviction on it. Take let's take Kenneth Copeland for instance, and that whole ilk. Um, Um, He's been doing his uh, name it and claim it thing for so long, and people buy into that. But what about what goes on in his heart and mind? I guess that's the thing that fascinates me the most. Um, Does our fallen nature play a part in that, that these things that that we teach, that self-delusion is actually appealing to us as people? Yeah, well, yeah, it goes back to the, the 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 primary struggle that every believer faces. So the fact is, when we trust in Christ and Him alone for salvation, and we are instantly born again by faith, uh, it does not mean that we, from then on, can never sin. We still have that old man, and, and Paul talks about the old man, new man dichotomy there in Ephesians and Colossians. He describes his own struggle with the flesh in Romans chapter 7. And then in Galatians 5, he, he, he doctrinally and theologically explains to us that the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, so that we do not do the things that mm. we wish. So if, you, if a believer caters to the flesh... He's capable of, uh, you know, being deceived and falling into all kinds of immorality. In fact, I often say there's no sin that an unbeliever can commit that a believer might not also commit if he's catering mm. to the flesh. So, uh, but if we walk in the spirit, then you know we produce the fruit of the spirit, and so righteousness is born out of our positional righteousness in Christ. We're justified before a holy God. We are now righteous in our standing before God. Nothing can ever change that. But the goal is, as we live out our days, and, and either until the Lord comes back or we go the way of all flesh, we ought to have that positional righteousness be reflected in practical righteousness mm. outwardly in what we do. But that's mm. not guaranteed. Uh, God doesn't force people to obey. The Spirit of God does not force us to do what's right. If he did, we'd all be perfect because the Holy Spirit's perfect. So I love, you know, the verse that you started out the program with there in Proverbs 22. It says, so that I, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have instructed you today, even you, I have written to you excellent things of counsels Mm. and knowledge that I may make, you know, the certainty of the words of truth. So it all goes back to the the truth, the word of God, the written revelation of God. And I think when believers get out of the word and they're not mm-hmm. spending regular time uh, rightly dividing the word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15, then they become sitting ducks for other deceptions to come in. So 
You know, you mentioned Kenneth Copeland, clearly a heretic, clearly teaching false doctrine. I've never met him. He may be a nice guy. I, I don't. I'm not necessarily impugning his motives. I'm just saying, based on the authority of Scripture, when we listen to what he teaches, it is off the reservation. Yeah. How did he get there? Well, I don't know. That's between him and the Lord. But I can tell you this much: if he's a believer, it's because he mishandled the Word of God and allowed false teaching to take root, and then he just ran with it. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we have to guard against. That's why the Word has to always be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Mm-hmm. And God also allows these things to continue on: um, the Word, faith, teaching, and all the other things that Christians did not kick to the curb over the last several decades are still with us because Satan never lets a good uh, deception go to waste, and a new generation will pick up where another one left off. And um, I guess I I would ask you what you think about that, why God allows these things to continue on um, through the church. Is it the wheat and tares, or what what would you say about that? Well, you know, I think about that a lot. And in fact, just recently, we've been talking with some friends about it, and and the Lord's just really been kind of showing me some things and kind of helping me through the Word of God to try to make sense of it. But it's the age-old question of why evil? You know, why doesn't God put a stop to it now? Mm. Why does God allow suffering to continue? Why is he going to give the Antichrist uh, and Satan and the false prophet seven years uh, to Mm. to wreak their havoc? You know, and, and the answer is best I can come up with is comes down to Romans 11 and understanding the distinction between our linear world of time, space, and matter, and the fact that God is atemporal, he's eternal, he's outside of time, space, and matter. In fact, he created time. The Bible twice says before time began, uh, and the Bible begins with the beginning of time, Mm -hmm. in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Beginning of what? Time. So God is eternal. So what that means is that from God's perspective, everything is happening in the eternal now, uh, whereas from our perspective, you know, it's happening today, tomorrow, the next day. So we cry out for justice before a holy God, and God's up there in eternity saying, it's already done. Uh, I know it doesn't seem like it, but he's like, it, it's done. I, I don't know why you're bitter. I don't know why you're angry. I don't know why you're shaking mm-hmm. your fist toward heaven, because it's already done. And 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 we call that in technical terms in theology, a prolepsis, where the Bible speaks of something as if it's already done, even though in time, space, and matter, it hasn't happened yet. For example, Psalm 2, of a passage I go back to again and again for the Luciferian conspiracy, talks about how the kings and rulers of the earth are conspiring together to throw off God's control, and it says God laughs at them and so forth. Well, why does he laugh at them? Because he goes on to tell us, because he has already set Mm. His king, King Jesus, on the throne. Now, Mary, you and I know full well Jesus is not sitting on the messianic throne in Jerusalem in the rebuilt temple ruling with a rod of iron, at least last time I checked. But from God's perspective, he is. So we need to, that's when, that's what faith really comes down to. Uh, Hebrews 11 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I get it. I get that we suffer. I get the way of injustices. Wendy and I have experienced that many times uh, through life. There are heartaches and tragedies and unfairness mm-hmm. from man's perspective. But that we got to set our minds on things above, as you mentioned earlier from S- Scripture, Colossians, and recognize that from God's perspective, it's already done. Mm-hmm. Wow. And when you think about the fall as well, you know, God couldn't leave them in the garden. He couldn't leave them in an unredeemed state forever, and you have, where Satan actually wins. You know, locked into that unredeemed state for eternity. So then, the redemption had become uh, had to be put in motion, and now we're just in the war. I, I just consider this whole segment of time of of man's the reign of man as this war for men's souls following the fall, and we're still in that. And I think of COVID, this is funny because when I, I think about time a lot, actually, I'm fascinated by it. I think about COVID and that one year or maybe a year and a half or so that things were really miserable. Tribulation is seven years, and I cannot imagine what it would be like to be here for seven years. We thought that one year was long. That was nothing. Yeah, and, I mean, it's bad enough already, and it's yes, going to get worse. It is. Uh, yeah. We are promised that we won't be here during the reign of terror of the Antichrist. I believe mm-hmm. very clearly the Bible teaches that. In fact, I, at Plum Creek Chapel, I've been teaching through First Thessalonians. We'll get to Second Thessalonians next. 
And uh, this week, it just so happens this coming Sunday, we're at chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, which is the preeminent passage on the rapture. And so we're going to camp out there and spend at least a couple of weeks on the teaching of the rapture, and we're going to show how, you know, we are, are not going to be here when the wrath of God is poured out on the earth because we're not children of wrath, we're mm. uh, children of God. And so, yeah, it's it's hard to imagine when we see how bad things are getting now that they can get worse, but mm. uh, they can. And frankly, folks, we better be prepared because uh, there's no guarantee we won't have to go through some severe suffering, even though we might, we won't have to be here when the Antichrist takes the helm. A lot can happen before then, and, and that's what folks need to be yeah. uh, keep in mind. Yeah, they really do. You have a great chapter in this book, The Great Last Day's Deception, called Anatomy of Deception. And you have five points here that I want to just delve into, however deep or however you want to cover these. The number one um, is question truth. Now, we're talking about Genesis here. And I'm always amused when I hear people say there is no absolute truth. There's no such thing as absolute truth, and they're absolutely sure about that. But yeah. absolute, you and I both know absolute truth does exist outside of human perceptions and biases. Um, so actually, they're talking from emotion. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So it, it yeah, I think they are, and it goes back to as you said, Satan's confrontation with Eve in Genesis chapter three. See, Satan is not creative. God is creative. <laughs> Satan just simply uses the same old tired tricks. So if we want to kind of get our hands on the the anatomy of deception, what are his what is his mo, so to speak? We just go back to Genesis three, and and he's using the same methodology, and it began by questioning uh, truth. Satan said. Has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Um, and it, it plants that seed of doubt. Did, did God really say that? You know, and that, that's where it begins. And uh, obviously, uh, Eve should have responded immediately, uh, uh, you know, yes. <laughs> uh, God said, you know, we couldn't eat of this one tree. This is what God said. Let me repeat it for you exactly. That's what Eve should have said. She should have stood on uh, the word, mm -hmm. uh, but she didn't. And, and by the way, I, I, you know, just last night I, I had an illustration of uh, how important it is to walk in the light as as he's in light, and and how the word of God is a lamp to our feet. Uh, my dog sometimes gets a little antsy at night. Juno is her name, a mm -hmm. white lab. And uh, when we live out here in the mountains, you know, so anything can stir her up. It could be a, an animal, you know, walking through the property. It just could be, you know, whatever. But last night she got restless, and so I had to get up. Well, I was so asleep and just sort of out of it that I was feeling my way through the the room, not wanting to turn the light on and wake Wendy up, and, you know, turned too soon and ran into the, the dresser before I got to the door to, to let Juno out of our room. And, uh, you know, it would have been much easier if I had the light. I would have seen the pathway. I would have mm. been able to navigate correctly. That's why it's so critical critical for believers to be in the Word of God, because mm -hmm. Satan is going to question it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know the Word, you're not going to have an answer. And uh, Eve, of course, you know, we didn't have the written Word of God at that time, but we had the Word of God, what he yeah. had told her, and she should have stood firm on that, but she didn't. Yeah. So these uh, five points, anatomy of deception. Number one, you just covered question truth. Number two, misrepresent truth. Wow, speculation, opinion, spin. We know all about that, uh, don't we, JB? These things make the world go around. Don't confuse me with the facts. Yeah. Misrepresenting yeah, you know, truth. Wow. Truth is a matter of opinion is what mm -hmm. Satan was essentially saying there because, uh, you know, uh, he, he goes on to just, uh, you know, misrepresent it. He, you know, God had not said, uh, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. God had said, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat except one. Mm -hmm. So it was a subtle uh, twisting and misrepresenting uh, of the truth. Mm -hmm. All right. Par uh, point number three, contradict truth, because the serpent said, you shall not surely die. Uh, and believing this lie actually caused death to enter into the world. Ugh. That's just, yeah, isn't that crazy? Uh, yeah, it is crazy. Yeah, that, <clears throat> by the time you get to the third step, you know, you're at the lie proper, yes. we might call it. Yes. You know, that's what we think of when we think of a lie. If I say to you, you know, the the the, sc the sky is, you know, green uh, and it's really blue, that's a lie, right? Well, that's true. But again, there's steps that lead up to that. It starts by questioning truth. Then you twist and misrepresent truth. But by the time you get to step three, Satan's just outright lying. Mm -hmm. He's saying... 
you will not surely lie. He'd already gotten Eve's attention. He'd already kind of bent her ear. She's susceptible to this to this type of thing. And so he, he hits her with the blatant lie. And that's the way deception operates today. It comes across clever, comes across, you know, let's just ask some questions. Is this really true? And you know, all of these old-fashioned, fun, quote, fundamentalist rules, are they really true? You know, is abstinence really good? And is purity really good? And these kinds of things. And then he then he begins to misrepresent it by, get, you know, they give false statistics, same, same pattern that we saw with COVID. But then eventually they just blatantly lie. And they say, taking this experimental gene-altering bioinjection will help you <laughs> when, in fact, it's killed millions of people. Right. I just saw another report just today uh, that uh, from uh, the, I think it was a CDC, let me get the exact quote here. Uh, yeah, it was uh, CDC discloses 780,000, 780,000, Mary, new reports of serious side effects mm. after the COVID-19 vaccination. So mm. yeah, question truth, misrepresent truth, and then directly contradict it. Mm. And we have so many ways that we can drink that in these days. I think visual media, because the world did not have visual media until, uh, I guess, till television came along. Well, movies, you know, 100 years ago, there were movies, but the visual media, and then throw AI into the mix to, to spread lies and contradict truth and make it so that you can't even tell anymore if you're seeing something that's true or false. And I think visual media is, is one of the number one things that leads us into judgment in this country that, that Satan is using to completely mess with people's minds. What are your thoughts on AI and all this? Oh, yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up because in my newest book that came out last fall, Spirit of the False Prophet, Rise of the Global Technocracy, we have a whole extensive chapter on AI. And I, I talk about AI Jesus in there mm, and mm -hmm. how it is another Jesus, as you said before the break. You know, it's this uh, fabrication. It's this uh, imposter, very similar to to the Antichrist. It's just a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the physical realm with the Antichrist. But yeah, people are flocking to this AI Jesus. And I actually have a conversation with the AI Jesus by giving it prompts. My friend uh, Shane, my resident technologist, helped me kind of write these prompts. And it, it was stunning, uh, the answers that this AI Jesus gave that flew right in the face of what the true Jesus, the almighty Son of God, said. And so, but, but yet people, because they're so deceived into thinking that AI is a good thing and how it's, uh, you know, going to help us transcend humanity and arrive at this, you know, utopian world where all we have to do is sit by the pool and sip lemonade, they're, they're inclined to lend an ear to AI Jesus and of course, he's leading them. Mm -hmm. The AI Jesus is straight down a path to hell. Uh, unlike the, the the real Jesus, who came to seek and to save that which is lost, gave his life for a lost world, and defeated death, hell, and the grave when he rose again. So, yeah, it's uh, I, I, you know, in the tribulation, you're not going to be able to tell reality from fiction. I think that's no. what the image of the beast is all about. Uh, Satan uh, is not omnipresent, neither will the Antichrist and false prophet be omnipresent. So they're going to have to use some type of technology to replicate themselves. Right. And this uh, burgeoning industry of embodied AI and being able to, you know, replicate yourself and your loved ones in very real terms Um Mm -hmm. is is part of that. You know, there's something in technology called the uncanny valley. My friend Shane taught me this, mm. where as robots have emerged and grown, at first, you could tell, obviously, these are not human. They, they just clearly, yeah. they're robotic, right? Yeah. And and But as they've gotten better, it was easier to make them look real. But the closer you go to them, you know, maybe from 20 feet away, they seem real, but you get closer and you realize, ah, uh, you know, there's something's not right. Maybe their skin is just not normal looking. Their eyes aren't normal looking. Right. That that distance is called uncanny valley. Well, that uncanny mm. valley distance is shortening to where now, you know, you can be standing next to an embodied AI and you might not even realize it. Wow. That that is that is scary to think about that. And also causing people to say things they would normally they wouldn't normally say for whatever reason, which could be very dangerous as believers. Um, I mean, that could land us in prison have, have, having this, although we, we speak the truth, we speak the gospel anyway, so I don't know how they can malign us any further. But in your anatomy of deception, the next one is focus on motives. And that's interesting. You know, Eve, why would God tell you that? 
God is holding out on you. What are the facts? Well, they're often inconvenient truths or inconvenient facts. You know, we tell someone that uh, who doesn't know the Lord, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of, the, of God. They may not like to hear that, but it is still true. And yet now we're maligning God's nature and appealing to how he feels about her, uh, about um how he feels about the situation, causing her to question God. What what is it about the motives now here that you've written about that that Satan is appealing to uh, her feelings plus God's character all in one swipe? Yeah, I mean this fourth step is critical, and we've we've actually lived through it with the onset of postmodern uh, thinking. Mm. And essentially, the fourth step is you shift the focus away from truth to perception. So you question truth number one, then misrepresent it, then directly contradict it, and then you kind of change the subject, so to speak, and you you claim okay. that perception is more important than reality. Facts mm. don't matter. It's an age of virtual reality, and perception is king. So, style over substance, sure. form over function. Uh, you know, the makeup man is more important than the speech writer, right? <laughs> yes. uh, speculation rather than empirical evidence. And so it's all about political correctness. It's, you know, why did you say what you said? And and it just gets people talking about all the wrong uh, things. And uh, that's critical because that's where most of the dialogue in the public square is today. All of the talking heads you see on TV, it's all about, you know, you hate me or why do you say this? And rather than the facts of of the matter. And that's what Satan's trying to do. Wow. Well, on the final one here, deconstruct language, which we've sort of just touched on briefly because it flows right into this deconstruct language. You know, Satan is a classic deconstructionist, uh, political correctness, cancel culture, Nothing means what you think it means anymore. JB, is there anything more frustrating for those of us trying to get to the truth of anything in this world? Yeah, I mean, it really is. You know, going back to the perception there, Satan said, you know, for God knows. In other words, he pur- pur- purported to climb inside the mind of God and explain why God said what he said. That's, <laughs> oh, that's what we mean when we say perception. <laughs> <laughs> but the last one here, you know, you know, deconstruct language altogether, invent completely new meaning for truth. Satan said, well, you will be like God. Well, I mean, he literally made that up. God didn't say anything like that. Yeah. And so that's the deconstructionism, which is just a big word that means uh, er- eliminating uh, original meaning yeah. uh, of words. Uh, you know, this is what Satan has known all along. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. If he can destroy language... He can win the battle. Frederick Nietzsche, that famous uh, atheistic German philosopher, said famously, I fear we are not getting rid of God because we still believe in grammar. See, he understood (laughs) that language matters, and that's why they're trying to deconstruct it. Wow, that's a great, great quote. Um, I want to ask you, we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I want to ask you about the mystery of lawlessness that, that Paul talks about. It's already at work in the world And I I tend to think of all the things that are going on behind the scenes because everything is building to this incredible crescendo uh, to the last days. We couldn't add one more thing, I don't think, prophetically to what is building behind the scenes. And then you have guys like uh, Harari who are are openly stating what they're doing. Is is the mystery of lawlessness, this behind the scenes elite, uh, elite group of people that are doing their thing at Satan's behest? What would you, how would you define that? Well, so that comes from 2 Thess 2 7. And uh, the, again, this is that famous passage talking about uh, the Antichrist and what life's going to be like under his regime. And he says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains him will do so till he's taken out of the way, talking about the rapture and how the Holy Spirit's influence through the church will be taken away. So mystery of lawlessness, let's break it down. What's a mystery? Well, a mystery in Greek is the word mysterion. It always refers to previously unrevealed truth okay. that is now being made known. Mm. So the rapture itself is a mystery, 1 Corinthians 15. The church age is a mystery, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And this lawlessness, and the ex- and I believe what he's talking about here is the extreme nature of it, is also a mystery. In other words, God is now revealing that lawlessness is going to get worse than you ever imagined. Uh, you know, lawlessness has always been around. It was around in, in Paul's day. But what he's saying is after the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is removed, it's going to get even worse. So it's already at work today, but let me tell you some new information. Let me give you a heads up. In other words, mm. it's going to be unprecedented when the Antichrist uh, takes the helm and uh, when the Holy Spirit's restraining influence is removed. Wow. That it should get interesting from here, and I, I don't want to put it that way in, in 
I'm excited about what these days portend, of course. I think we all are as a church. I'm not excited about all the the wickedness that's going to be unleashed. And I think we need to be on our toes uh, very much so. I hope that that's a takeaway from this today, that people are on their toes because we are in an election year. And another what that means to me more than anything is that lies are going to be cranked up exponentially. And that's something that we really, really need uh, to watch for. JB, thank you so much. Any Any last thoughts on deception? Uh, no, man, it's always a wonderful time being with you guys. Really appreciate the opportunity to get the word out. I encourage folks to pick up that little book, Great Last Day's Deception. Mm-hmm. I think it'll be instructive for a time such as this. I agree. And look over the website, the new website, all the resources that are out there, uh, like I said uh, earlier on. It's a beautiful website. The app is fantastic. And so I want to encourage people to do that. And um, we're done for the day, JB. We could have probably gone a lot longer, but we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for everything you're doing for the kingdom. And, and Lord bless you and your fellowship. And uh, uh, keep, keep speaking the truth, JB. Amen. Likewise, and my pleasure. All right. Tuesday, Monday, Monday, there'll be a replay. And then Tuesday, we have Robert Morgan. His book is called Whatever Happens. And he's going to tell us how to stand firm in our faith when the world is falling apart. And the world is definitely falling apart. And I'm um, looking forward to speaking with him on just an encouragement on how we can stand firm. Uh, so join me next week for Robert Morgan and much more. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What an encouragement. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Thank you for joining me, and I hope that you will join me next week for more Stand Up For The Truth. 